Uh, yes, as Audrey introduced, I'm going to talk to you about how you can use graph technology to better manage your cloud estate. So I'm going to start in a slightly unusual place by telling you about a king penguin chick. Uh, now these king penguin chicks, if you've watched um, many wildlife documentaries, you might know that these live in enormous colonies. Uh, which are full of lots and lots of different penguins, all making lots of noise and lots of smells all over each other. And when a pair of penguin comes back to this colony, they have to decipher that noise, find the right signal in it. And generally speaking, they're quite good at finding their chick. Uh, now, the reason I start with this is because I think it's quite a good analogy for your cloud estate if you run anything of any kind of large complexity. There's lots of consoles, portals, dashboards, alerts, monitoring, logs. There's an awful lot of data and information and noise coming out. But we have this problem of how you find the things you're interested in. Uh, for me at the FT and my team, we're interested in surfacing things which can help us use the cloud better. And it can be really difficult to find the problematic things in amongst all this information. And the basic reason for that is that data is not the same thing as knowledge. Um, but I'm speaking at a graph technology conference, so it won't surprise you to know that I am going to push the point that connected data can give you knowledge. So I'm essentially going to talk about how cloud data plus the twin uh, graph technologies of Neo4j and GraphQL can be turned into knowledge that we can use to manage our estate better. So a little more about me. Um, as Audrey said, I'm Rhys. I'm a principal engineer in the Engineering Insights team at the Financial Times. Um, I've been working there about eight or nine years. And for the first four years or so, I worked on the ft.com website. Now this is our flagship product. It's one of the world's leading uh, publishers of news on finance and business. Uh, and behind the scenes there, there are hundreds of microservices run by lots of different teams. We also have a lot of other user facing products. For instance, here's the Investors Chronicle and our new FT Edit iOS app. And again, there's different teams managing them and lots of different services I play. And again, there's lots of things the end consumer doesn't see. So this is our internal uh, custom built CMS, which is powers our news websites. And again, there's more teams involved and more systems to look after. Now a picture of that across the entire estate looks a bit like this. Those blue dots are teams and those orange dots are systems. Um, so across the entire state, there's lots going on and there's lots that can go wrong. And um, yeah, four years ago, I left FT.com to join the reliability engineering team, which was focused on improving reliability across this massive estate. Now, the initial problem I was tasked with solving is how do we make it quicker to find out who to speak to when something goes wrong? Because uh, when we had outages, uh, quite often, it would take longer finding the person who could fix it than it took them to fix it. So we really needed to, to decrease that time so that outages were recovered from much more quickly. And this is what we came up to solve it. Came up with to solve it. It's our documentation system. It's called BizOps, um, and it allows you to search and to browse everything in our tech estate. And you can read more detailed documentation and edit it if you find something wrong. Um, I've spoken about this before, uh, not least at Nodes about four years ago. Uh, if you're interested in hearing more, then there's lots of links to talks on my website. Now, under the hood, um, we run this on Neo4j and GraphQL. And the reasons we chose graph technologies is because the relationships between records are incredibly important. So the, the model which is at the core of this is we have products, which are the things that users interact with. These are powered by systems and they can have all kinds of dependency relationships between themselves. And they're looked after by teams and by people. Um, 
So that means when a product breaks, we can follow the links through to the systems that underpin it and follow them through to the teams and the people that need to be uh, contacted. And that has really transformed how long things are broken for. It's far easier now for us to speak to the right people quickly. Now this is what that model looks like applied to just my team. The blue dots are people, the orange dots are the systems we look after, and the yellow dots are the products. But there's kind of a more complete view we could have. This is uh, an alternative model showing all the things our team runs, including all the infrastructure. So that includes all our CDNs, all our data stores, all our compute instances, um, and lots of other things besides. And there's lots of value in that data, potentially. But if you combine that picture of one team with a picture of an entire department, then you very quickly get to something that looks like this penguin colony, just too much going on, very difficult to pick out the signal from the noise. And our team for the last year, uh, at least, has been really focused on how we turn that massive data into knowledge um, in order to help us transform the way we run our tech estate. So the first lesson I have to share with you is that it's important to dedicate effort to the problem. So about a year ago, we changed our name from Reliability Engineering to Engineering Insights. It's not just a name change. With that name change, it meant there were lots of problems in the reliability space that we no longer focused on. So we've got more people focused on this uh, set of problems around turning data into knowledge. And that focus has made, allowed us to really make progress. Alongside that, we've got um, commitment from our infrastructure management teams to provide us with the raw data. Without us getting hold of data about our infrastructure, we can't turn that into knowledge. So over the last year, um, we've been adding more and more things to our model of the estate. Most of those contributions are coming from outside our team, um, and they're as enthusiastic about providing the data as we are about getting it, because they know that providing it to us and combining it with our set of tools can really power some interesting transformations. So there are four, print. once we've got the data, there are four principles we apply to get the most use out of it. And the first one I'll talk about is keeping your data connected. So what do I mean by connected data? Um, I think the first aspect is that there should be no boundaries between subsets of data. So this could mean if you've got a data set about CDNs and a data set about servers, don't keep them separate and make sure you're kind of expressing which CDNs are connected to which servers. Similarly, if you've got things owned or run by different departments, don't keep them separate because if those things interact in the real world, then you're gonna want the data about them to interact. An example of where this is delivering value for us is a thing that used to be really hard to manage was that each AWS account we run has a security scanner in it. Um, and when we need to upgrade that, we'll create a new instance and then go back and clean up the old instance. Um, but we need to do that across 90 accounts. Now, the process to go and check that we have been tidying up after ourselves and cleaning up those old instances uh, was a bit like this. Um, you'd have to log into an account and manually check for old instances, and then you just do that 90 times across 90 accounts. And there's lots of other governance, task, governance tasks which are similar, where it's just a matter of going in and manually checking lots of accounts. And I have a confession here that that was so tedious to do that we weren't doing it effectively. And that caused us to spend a lot of money um, running instances we no longer needed. And there's, you know, there's potential for security flaws and things like that to crop in because um, you're running stuff which is out of date. But now we've been able to improve with that using graph technologies. So you can see on the right there, there's a query which is about 10 lines long. Now we have the data about all our accounts in a single graph database, we can just query it in one place. And you can see on the right, we've uncovered that one account 
has three instances in it, another account has two instances, and we're able to shut them down and save some money. Another aspect of connectedness, which I think is really important, is that you try and map as many relationships between records as possible, because a rich model with more relationships can give more powerful insights and power more use cases. An example of where we're getting value here is in how we manage our DNS records. Um, we already manage our DNS as infrastructure as code. So we have a big repository full of lots of YAML files that define all our DNS records, all the way from ft.com down to obscure little things that, you know, have bits of infrastructure. But we have a problem when it comes to merging changes safely, whether it's ft.com or all these little obscure DNS records. Um, we don't really want to open up for anyone to make a change because there's potential to do some real damage to our estate by doing that. But then the team that look after the DNS repository, they don't, as other than for a few, such as ft.com, they don't really have the context to be able to successfully review changes to other records. I mean, how, they, how could they? There are thousands of domains um, inside this repository. Um, it'd also be a bottleneck if they were expected to review every pull request. But the graph can help us apply controls in a meaningful way. Here we can see the data we've got in the graph. We've got host records now, and they're connected to infrastructure, which are in turn and connected to systems and the teams that are responsible for them. And then reaching out from teams, we've got a uh, data map to people. And then GitHub Teams and GitHub users because we import data from GitHub as well. And what this allows us to do is when a person makes a change to a host, we're able to check should they be making a change to that host. And we can also add the, get the relevant GitHub team as a reviewer. Now, this massively improves the efficiency um, of review PRs because it's distributed around the department and improves the quality as well because the people who have the context able to review that change appropriately, they are copied in on it. Now, in order to power that, this is the kind of queries we're talking about. Um, so between two queries, which I'll, I'll maybe talk a bit later about how these are glued together under the hood, um, but we have essentially nine tables being joined together there, including one recursively. And this is where we really get the value of our choice of you Neo4j know, as a database because that query can execute um, really efficiently. We don't really have to worry about tuning that query. In a SQL table, I think you would have to put quite a lot of effort into figuring out how to make that complex query performance. So a second principle of getting value from this data is to keep it open. So I've already spoken about how connected data equals knowledge, but of course you have to have some kind of brain in there, either human brain or possibly AI, if you're uh, ambitious, in order to actually create that knowledge. It stands to reason that the more brains you have looking at that data, the more knowledge you're going to have. So opening up access is going to create more knowledge for you. This is probably as good a point as any to talk a little bit about GraphQL. I'm sure most people are here by now, halfway through the second day of the conference, know what Neo4j is. Um, but GraphQL is a query and API specification for interacting with graphs of data. And it was developed at Facebook because they had people building user interfaces that had to request data from loads and loads of APIs in parallel. And this was inefficient and difficult to use. So they kind of invented GraphQL as a way of stitching APIs together and creating an interface which was more uh, friendly to interact with. And what Neo4j have done is they've created a library which essentially then converts these GraphQL queries back into Cypher. So essentially, you're able to use GraphQL as a query language for your, um, for your Neo4j database. But why would we even add that layer? So there are a few reasons. Um, the first one is around safety of execution. Um, if you give people access to write their own cipher, you give them permission to possibly write dangerous queries which will crash, which will crash your database. 
Um, GraphQL, it has lots, uh, at least the implementation that Neo4j have provided, has lots of filters built in. So it's quite powerful. It's not as powerful as Cypher, but it's um, good enough for most of the needs we come across. And there are ways to extend that. Um, so yeah, it, it, it does for us. Um, also with GraphQL, you already get an API. So uh, we have an API gateway at Financial Times and we integrate the API with that. So we already have a way of managing access to it. We don't need to write an API or introduce some processes to manage database users or anything like that. So it takes care of that problem for us. Um, and finally, GraphQL is, is quite new as a technology, maybe less than 10 years old, but it's really growing in popularity very quickly. Uh, and there's a rich ecosystem of tooling around it. So you're providing people who want to interact with the data with something more familiar than saying, go off and learn me off a J and Cypher. So those are all uh, three very important principles which have uh, enabled us to have a lot of success. So this is what that looks like. Um, we have the GraphQL Playground, which is an interface for exploring the data uh, that's open source. Um, with that integrates quite easily with, um, we use Okta as our single sign-on provider. So that means that anyone in the department can have access. And we have a Slack bot for our API gateway and users can easily ask for an API key automatically, which will give them access to use the data programmatically. Now, just as a tangent, um, I will add that because GraphQL comes from a world its original use case was gluing different APIs together. Uh, even though the implementation we have from Neo4j is about um, uh, kind of providing a query language for the Neo4j database, you can still stitch it to the other data sources. So if you get other things such as time series um, or metrics or, or something like that, that won't really fit in a Neo4j database, but is useful to connect to other sources of data you've got you can do that. And that means we're opening up access to other um, sources of data as well, which again, increases the pool of connected data and leads to more potential to create knowledge. <clears throat> so the next principle is easiness. Um, so I'm fond of saying to people at the FT, when they hear, about, hear me talk about GraphQL and they kind of go, oh, what's that? sounds scary, I just say it's as simple as SQL. Um, and it really is. Here are three examples of queries in each language, which are all of them getting active people and getting a few properties on each. And other than syntax, they're about the same in terms of number of, uh, number of statements in them and complexity. But GraphQL, I think, is actually a lot simpler than SQL. Um, so if you want to do something more complicated, joining tables, for instance, in uh, SQL, you have to write a join, you have to know which columns include keys and things like that. Um, and Cypher is, I, I would say, quite a lot easier. It's um, written, it's well, it's designed to query relationships primarily. Uh, but I think GraphQL wins out right here because in the advanced tools you get, there's autocomplete, which is very forgiving. And it's very easy to construct a query, which not only does it um, does it uh, ask the right data, it kind of looks like it's asking for the right data. It's it's very intuitive, and the tools they also contain lots of handy stuff like um, error correction for your typos. Another great thing I think is when you query the data, you get data back which looks the same structure. So here we've got. Um, a few properties with one nested and the response data looks exactly the same. Now, to me, this is really powerful because when you're working with graphical data, if you're working with something which just returns rows of data, that to me is a bit jarring kind of uh, conceptually when you're trying to manipulate the data. So having something which returns nested graph-like data is really nice. Having said that, <laughs> We have built a reporting tool which can convert it back into rows of data because that is sometimes what you want. And this also contains the ability to parameterize queries. Now we've trained about 100 people on this, mainly engineers, 
also some technically minded non-engineers as well, because as I mentioned before, it's no more difficult than SQL and there's lots of people outside of engineering who have an interest in managing our estate um, who would like to be able to work with the data like this. And this has led to some brilliant changes. It used to be the case that our team was reaching out to people, chasing people, asking them to engage with the data uh, and use it. But now we're no longer the middleman. Um, we, these, this graph of information and the tools around it have become a medium that teams can use to communicate with each other about the technology we run. Um, and it's, it's really leading to lots of things happening quite quickly. Which takes me on to the next point, which is it's important that your data is fast to interact with. <clears throat> So data-led decision-making is uh, quite an important thing if you want to be a successful business. And typically this means you should have a fast learning cycle. So you can ask a question from the data, get an answer back, and that informs you quick enough that it can inform your next question and so on and so forth. And you continue in cycles until you find the question that you perhaps need to do something else on. And if you're having to wait days or weeks or even hours to get an answer, this can slow down that process and make it less effective. But what I've described about our stack, um, hopefully you're convinced that we've built something um, that allows our users to self-serve answers to questions of arbitrary complexity, and they get instant answers. So that's incredibly uh, good there for making sure people are um, data led. Uh, so that's good, but I think we can do even better. Uh, so a question a lot of our teams have <clears throat> is what should my team be most worried about? Is it security? Is it reliability? Is it costs? Um, and we have lots of data on this. We have like email alerts, Slack alerts, um, custom dashboards, most of the tools we use will have alerts or reporting within them as well. So there's lots of data, but as I've said before, this is not the same thing as knowledge. So for the last uh, year, this has been a big focus for us. And what we've come up with is a thing called Problem Hub, which is a set of tools for routing these kind of problems with the estate in the most effective way uh, to target the messages at the right people. So first of all, um, the first step is to identify a problem. Uh, now, there are two ways of it. Um, uh, to, sorry, the, there are two ways to get problems in. You can either use our post API and if, or create things manually, just say there's a problem with this thing. But what we're encouraging people to do is to leverage the data we actually have in the graph. So you can see here, there's a query which uh, looks for Heroku apps whose stack is beyond its end of support life. What that returns is a list of Heroku apps which need to be upgraded. So you can send that list of Heroku apps into the API. Um, and then we do insist that people provide remediation advice with, with these things. So don't tell people something needs upgrading tell them what it needs upgrading to and how you do that. And again, the graph of information can provide useful context here um, and can be used to generate more targeted uh, advice depending on the precise case. <laughs> and finally, this is, this is probably the, the real strength of uh, Problem Hub, is teams creating problems, they only need to know there's a problem with a thing because embedded within the Problem Hub API, we have all these queries which use the graph to connect those problems back to the team that is ultimately responsible for it. And this can sometimes be quite long chains of relationships uh, through the graph. So again, that choice of Neo4j as a database really means we can be performant doing that and we don't need to worry too much about optimizing it. Although it's, it's becoming an increasingly popular tool and uh, you know, traffic is going up and up. So for once, we do uh, the success of it is actually meaning we to think a little bit about optimizing things. Um, uh, so now, that question, what should my team be most worried about? 
The answer to that is your peers using the graph have already told you. So we're not just, uh, so we're really getting ahead of things rather than waiting for people to ask questions and giving a fast response. So here's an example of that in action. Um, we have a bit of a cost saving drive at the moment, at the minute, and somebody found that an S3 bucket, which should have contained just a few bytes of data, actually contained terabytes of data because they had misconfigured the logging on it. Um, and they realized, well, this is something that other people could do. It's an easy mistake to make. Um, so within a few hours, we had our team that manages our cloud estate adding uh, these properties and these relationships to our model and adding a few lines to their data importer to write that data to our API. And then we had the data in the graph and we were able to query and see which buckets were logging where. And we shared a message in Slack. We didn't actually get around to adding it to Problem Hub because just providing this information to people via, via the graph um, was enough to get people to respond to it. But in general, the common practice now is people will find a problem um, and they don't necessarily send a message in Slack. You can just kind of instantly go from finding that problem to generalizing it via, uh, via Problem Hub and that also broadcasts it to the people who need to know. So that means anything which is wrong with our estate, we can make sure that the people who need to fix it know and also know how important it is compared to other things. And that just about wraps things up. Um, I'll just end by summarizing with a few thoughts. Um, so managing a large cloud estate can be overwhelming and the amount and variety of data available doesn't necessarily make it easier. But using graph technologies to represent it can help a lot. Um, as well as these four practices, keeping your data connected, open, easy, and fast. Thank you. And I did say we're hiring, so do please reach out to me on Twitter or there's the link for our um, careers website. Thank you.